so now that we got a little bit of that Zoom housekeeping out of the way, um, we can probably start recording as um, I would like to introduce to you Emily Weiss and Joe Slinsky from the Ford House. We love you at the Ford House and we enjoyed your presentation so much when you came by to do our uh, Victory, work Victory Garden Workshop in June and which seems like an eternity but uh, <laughs> Here we are in the winter, and um, I know we noticed that you had a happy house plant program at the Ford House, and I thought, well, I think that's wonderful that we could have that here, because I think all of us who are here have house plants that aren't very happy with us right now. Um, through the years, I've had quite a few of those, and I know um, I've been looking forward to this this program tonight to hear all your thoughts on on how we can make our plants happy and thriving. So with that, Emily and Joe, I turn it over to you. All right, and I will share my PowerPoint. I'll start with a little background for anyone who doesn't know. So we're from, um, part of the Ford House. The Ford House is an 87 acre historic home located in Gross Point Shores, Michigan. Um, it's the home of Edsel and Eleanor Ford. And we have this lovely estate that Joe is the tree expert and plant expert at. Um, he's the manager of landscape here. We also have a beautiful indoor space. And we're really excited to say in spring of this year, we'll open up a new visitor center and admin building. Um, so come check us out if you like us. Um, so we'll get started with happy house plants with James slash Joe, depending on the day. Yeah. <laughs> and Emily Weiss. Good evening, everybody. I hope uh, Wednesday night has found you all well. Um, and this is just a little bit of what we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to go into things in a little more detail, a little long-winded as well. So I'll talk and, and then just stop myself suddenly. So um, things that we're going to cover tonight are, you know, obviously about, I think the selection is about 10 different starter plants for beginners. Um, acquiring those, the where to, where you should, where you can, you know, an inspection, which is something that a lot of people don't do, is looking for damage or, you know, maybe something on, on it that can transfer to your house plants, like insects or diseases, um, you know, things to look out for, overwatering, potential light issues, you know, you might be getting something from Home Depot that doesn't have a tag, and it might be a highlight plant going in a low light area, so just looking it up online might help. Uh, different fertilizing methods, some store-bought stuff and some DIY things as well. Two different methods we'll talk, talk about. Uh, repotting, which pretty much every house plant needs after you know three to four years of sitting in, in its own pot. Um, just some general you know, maintenance and general care of the house plants as well. So the 10 house plants that we're going to cover and the red ones, I believe, were listed as um, poisonous to cats and dogs, potentially hamsters. We don't know. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, everybody knows pothos and philodendrons. Those are two of the hard ones to kill. And then there's the Sansevieria, which is another great house plant, very hard to kill. Aglonema, succulents. Those are very hardy as well, unless we water them too much. Peace lilies, spider plants, ponytail palms, dracaenas, and ZZ plants. These are all common things we can acquire at all the local nurseries or, or uh, gardening stores. First on the list is the Aglonema plant. Um, common name, this is most likely what you'll see it listed as when you go to a uh, nursery store is the Chinese evergreen. It's native to China. Most house plants are not native to America. Surprise, surprise. Um, it handles low light conditions and high light conditions very well. Its habit will change a little bit, potentially like it'll get darker in high light and in, in, um, whiter in low light, depending on its variegation. Um, these require water weekly. They deal well with, um, with a little bit of overwatering. So if they had like a catch tray underneath them that filled up with water, they'd be fine with that. Um, fertilize them monthly with whatever your preferred method is, which we'll talk about later on. And then, you know, pretty much everything we talk about, unless it's something small, is a rule of thumb is a repot every two to three or four years. So um, 
or when that sometimes you put house plants in their perfect condition you have to repot it like every year because it just grows insane and then um obviously this one was red so we're gonna list it as poisonous to cats and dogs um is it evergreen like an actual evergreen is it just called that do you know I don't know. I really don't that's, know. That's was, the second one. <laughs> it was given to me. My original one was given to me by your predecessor. And oh. it was the first time I had ever even like, uh, you know, heard of this plant. And then I, you know, found out how hardy it was after that. And it's just insane. I mean, it's, a, it handles drought. Like if you had to leave for a month, this thing would probably be fine. It handles overwatering, you know, like if you watered it too much, all of a sudden, it would deal with it all right. It doesn't handle like standing water long term very well, but it's so as long uh, as it has a hard. hole and a catch tray, and you can forget about it and feel bad and overwater it and have that cycle yeah, back I mean, and forth. I mean, here's <laughs> a great time to like overwater plants accidentally because it just evaporates because of how dry everything is. But yeah, I mean, it, uh, it's a hardy plant. Are these only bad for them if they uh, can't? Uh, Oh, no, they can be around them to brush into them fine. It's just that if they get the juices of the plant in their like saliva glands or in their gut, that is, is what's bad. So you can have all the poisonous plants you want for cats and dogs, as long as the cats and dogs respect them, you know. And some, you know, cats are just like chewers and they chew on plants for some reason. Some cats are not. Like my cat doesn't mess with plants at all. He'll brush upon them, you know, like itch himself, but that's about it. And the Dracaena plant, which... It's funny, right on the other side of my laptop, I'm staring at one right now, um, pretty similar to the one on the right. But the common name is the corn plant or the ribbon plant, just given, you know, its, its leaves and its fronds, how ribbon-like they are. Not native to America, native to Africa, prefers low to medium light. Um, in the sun, this plant can get sunburned and it'll actually lose its leaves. Uh, requires water weekly. And similar to the Chinese evergreen, it can take periods of drought, fertilize monthly, and then to repot it every three years. The peace lily, simple enough, common name, peace lily. This is native to the tropical Americas and uh, Asia. Likes moderate light with partial shade. So sometimes if it gets good sun in the evening or good sun in the morning and then shady the rest of the day, um, it reacts pretty well to that. Water when the leaves begin to droop, they'll stand up tall and look you know, fairly um, proud, I would say. And then you can kind of monitor this plant by just watching it, uh, its habit and its leaves will kind of start to droop a little bit. But this is a plant that doesn't deal well with with too much drought stress. It can handle a little bit of it, but if um, it gets it for too long, it takes like like a, a whole year of just watering the plant perfectly to get it to bounce back. So, and that's just to get these pretty little flowers. It'll grow leaves all day long, but it won't get these flowers on it. And it's fertilized monthly and repot when the plant outgrows its container. These ones and the Chinese evergreens can be something like we call pot busters. They can get so root bound that it'll actually break a pot uh, what causes the brown ends of the leaves on the plant? Uh, the root tips could be drying out or um, there could be some type of fungus um, in, the, in the root system, which is really hard to, to get rid of unless you buy a, like an organic fungicide or something. This is a really good one um, if you have any little kids around. Um, the pollen is really visible on it, so it can be a good teaching aid for, for little ones. And you can really, you just smack it on your hand and it comes out. Yeah. The Hartley philodendron. This is uh, one of my favorites. I just love that, that contrast between the light and the dark green. Um, the common name, Hartley philodendron, horsehead philodendron, not really known as that in the northern parts of the country, more so in the south. Um, first bright indirect light, um, water weekly. Fertilize monthly, trim back when the plant outgrows its space, like that one up on the, the little plant stand there. It's looks like a, it's got a nice little haircut, and um, usually those runners would be all over the place. And you can take them and repot them as well. They repot very, very, or, you know, you can root them in water or just stick them in soil, and the, they'll root at where 
each leaf comes out so yeah i've been seeing a lot of that just like on instagram and stuff just like a, a whatever an old co a coke can and the leaf of a philodendron and it re, re roots it's really cool yeah we, i said shop for this meeting and i had a a plant that we we took a cutting of and it was rooting in like a co old coca-cola glass and the glass fell over because it was <laughs> so it had gotten too big because it's growing you know good a good amount of roots so it's just like I'm like looking everywhere I go is always plant things. So the ponytail palm, this is one I've been gifted many times. I don't know, but it seems to be a, a popular one for winter around here. Um, the ponytail palm, common name ponytail palm, the elephant's foot, because of the way that the uh, base of the, the stump there grows. A member of the agave family. Which that, that means that this is not actually a tree or a palm. It's kind of like a hybrid of, of, of both. It likes bright light, tolerates moderate light conditions. This is a great one for like your front window right on top of a table. Um, it deals really well with that. Uh, water weekly, fertilize monthly, remove the dead fronds after a while. Um, you can see on the bottom of this one, uh, just above the, the base, there's like a three to four inch stem. And after 15 years, this will have like a, you know, a 10 foot stem. So if it's a long-term plant in your house, it's gonna grow. It grows really slowly though. So you're not gonna worry about, you know, it overtaking a room anytime soon, but those, those fronds at the bottom will brown out slowly. And as they do, you just kind of pull them downward and they pop right off. Pothos. This is my favorite one, one of the easiest ones to care for. And you can get like the most bang for your buck because of all these different types of foliage from um, oh um you can cut the stems off on your ponytail as as well and it will push the growth into the uh you know if you cut two off, that one's a single stem, but sometimes like these other modern ones, they just, they'll cut the, uh, like a section of that stem off. Like when that stem gets 15 feet tall, they cut it into 15 one foot sections and root each section. And then those sections will get five or six heads like you're seeing here. So I think what they're asking is, should you cut those back? I would not cut them back, that plant, uh, put them out for a reason. You can cut them back like one by one. And over time it will, um, essentially push that energy into the other fronds and it'll put out put out more growth there so you can put you know put it form back into what you would call like a central leader but in reality if it doesn't bother you um i wouldn't really mess with it so yeah back to the pothos here just the most bang for your buck and uh the um you can just get everything from like you know like these spotted leaves to these striped leaves and there's so much different colors of variegation it's just there's a lot going on. Um, it's a great uh, shelf plant or hanging plant. You can put it in a basket, hang it from the ceiling, put it up on that corner of a hutch or, you know, maybe your cabinets in the kitchen or on a mantle or something like that. Um, this one you can water weekly. It grows prolifically. You can see that one on the right is, uh, I would say that's no more than like two years old. They, I mean, they grow really, really fast. Uh, trim them when they outgrow the space. These ones are kind of tricky. You always want to move those those um, runners around because they can actually send out little like rootlets that will like kind of adhere to things. I had one that was like climbing up my wall for a while and uh, I didn't notice until I had to like trim it back and I'm like, holy cow. But like that's how they stick to trees and stuff in the jungle. Uh, trim it when it outgrows its space. Yeah, you had that happen, it's surprising. When you see that, you're like, wait a minute, my house is nature. So yeah. <laughs> You know, repot every two years. This one, it grows like wildfire. If you don't cut it back, then you don't really need to, re or if you do cut it back, then you don't need to repot it as, as much. But um, if you let it go wild, those roots are as long as those runners. So you can imagine what it feels like to be that many roots inside of that pot. So this one's, right. um, although it is poisonous to cat, cats and dogs, it's a really easy one to hang from just one of those yeah. macrame hangers and keep it out of their reach if you have um, tall enough ceilings. So there's a workaround. It feels like all the good uh -huh. fun ones are poisonous so, to cats and dogs. 
Samantha asked if it was invasive. No, they're not invasive. You can take them and actually use them in, as like a tr an annual plant in your garden. So you wanted to use it as like ground cover. And then as soon as the um, first frost comes, this plant gets zapped instantly. It's kind of like a begonia or an impatient or something like that, if you think of it in that manner. Um, I know over at the um, Henry Ford Estate, they use some pothos and some like wandering Jew and stuff like that as, as ground cover in some of their beds. And uh, they don't even like um, dig it up in the spring or, or the fall or anything. They just let the frost get it. And since it's like so watery of a plant that once the cells all freeze and burst, they, uh, it turns into like, you know, it disintegrates right in the compost. Yeah, they, you can use them as annual. They will not be a perennial in, in Michigan. If, if they're coming back like every year, it's probably not this. It's probably something else. There's a lot of escaped like basket plants. You know, people buy these pots and things like that that have like variegated IVs or um, a multitude of other things that can root down into your garden that are, are perennial and very invasive in Michigan. And uh, then all of a sudden, you know, two, three years later, you see it like take over the side of your house, like you're thinking. And um, so I don't know, maybe it could be this and maybe it might be something else. But if you send us a photo, we can chase it out for you. Just email Emily or I and uh, we'll, we'll run out a response for you and, um, and let you know. We like doing it. It's fun to learn things that way. Yeah. I love hard we're questions. The, we're <laughs> the plant detectives. <laughs> So Sansevieria, common name is mother-in-law's tongue, the sword plant, the snake plant. I had a vote today in, um, in my department. Everybody voted this is their favorite house plant. Um, it's native to West Africa, prefers bright to moderate light. This is one, you know, that does good in pretty much the corner of any room. Like I've heard this one be referred to as the fraternity plant because it's been known to be only watered with beer and it still survives in like the end of a hallway where there's no light and it, you know they just keep on it's a very very hardy plant um it handles periods of drought really well if these if you didn't water it for like a you know a month on end or you know months and months it's obviously gonna dehydrate and, and be very bad for this but um these grow from the tips you see those spiky little tips they're kind of pointy but they're not as pointy as you think and some people will cut them off. That is actually where the plant like elongates from. So if you get this, try to protect those tips because even if they, you can see that one right in the middle is broken and that leaf is kind of shorter than everything else, it's now stunted. It won't go any much further than that. It might grow real slow, but it won't grow like those ones on the outer left and right that are, you know, just surpassing it. But this one's fun. It comes in all kinds of wide uh, varieties. It comes in uh, stripes and yellows and, you know, almost blues in, in some ways. So it's a, it's a fun one to, uh, to try out. And you can find them anywhere. This one's considered um, a good for air, indoor air quality as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's, it's like funny too, like if, if you don't have houseplants and you're interested, get like five at once, right? It might seem overwhelming, but then... If you put them in like your, your office or some space that, you know, the, the air stays in that room only for the most part, unless you have your doors open, you'll actually notice a difference throughout the day of uh, from the tr plants transpiring that you'll actually smell the air. I mean, I do at least of being a little cleaner. Oh, I feel like, especially in the winter too, it just feels, it's, it's so dry and so um, hard to manage, but yeah. a little bit of, yeah, house plants make a difference. Um, synthetic versus organic. I don't really push for synthetic very much. I do always say that like miracle grow is, um, a miracle because it, you know, however they synthesize all of the compounds in it and the, the nutrients, I'm not sure. I know it's, it, it's not organic in nature, but it, it is a miracle because it does contain every macronutrient and micronutrient that plants require, which is what causes it to be such a miracle you know so your plant could be deficient on molybdenum and everybody's like what i didn't even know what molybdenum was that's a you know it's a mineral and your plant needs it 
you know, in such a small quantity, but if it doesn't have it, it's like us, you know, if we have to have the right levels of things and if we don't get them, you know, we don't do well and neither will our plants. So Miracle Grow, not my, uh, it's a go-to for me when I'm like, I just need um, something now and I don't have anything. I, but like I preferred making my own like compost teas and stuff like that when uh, doable. So we'll talk a little bit more on a few different types of fertilizer later on. But another one here, the spider plant. The uh, spider plant is one of another one of my favorites. Super hardy. This plant can deal with drought stress really well. It propagates super easily. Um, it's native to Africa. Prefers bright to moderate light. This is a good porch plant for the summer as well. Um, water weekly. Fertilize monthly, trim when overgrown. So I don't know, some people don't, some people know this plant like the back of their hand because everybody has one. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, the runners, those little mini spider plants hanging off, if you just cut those off and set them on top of soil, you'll propagate those plants and they'll become, um, they'll become more spider plants, so more and more and more. All right. I'm going to go to the chat real fast. We got a bunch of questions rolling in real fast. Uh, organic, synthetic, we covered that real quick. Uh, why are some of my leaves brown? I don't. Are your leaves brown on your spider plant is what I'm wondering. And Cheryl, what light are you referencing? Your spider plant? It, does, it prefers uh, bright to moderate light, so either or. It doesn't really have a, I mean, um, this plant will deal with direct bright light. Like if you set it in the middle of your front lawn, it would do, it would do just as good as if you put it in the corner of your room. So um, it'll handle both. Is there anything challenging particularly about these spider plants? No, I picked most of these plants because of their ease and there's not a lot that you can do wrong to them. Now any, all plants are kind of subject to fungus and disease and insects, but like these ones, um, they're pretty hardy and they're pretty um, um, they're pretty tough against those um, those insects and disease problems anyway. So, okay. can you propagate the spider plant uh, in indirect light? Um, you can. I would imagine yes. If the spider plant, if you put it somewhere and it's growing, I would imagine that the babies will also um, react similarly to like the mother plant. And this yeah. plant is interesting, like it, it reminds me of a forest where there's like a mother tree that has root grafted to all of its baby trees around it and they, they all talk to each other. So like the healthiest way to do this is just have some pots like around that pot, around this spider plant and just set those babies on top of it. On the bottom of the babies, you'll see like all these little like knobby looking little like rootlet looking things. And that's what you kind of, you just nestle them into the soil a little bit. You don't want to bury the leaves in the soil at all because that'll um, rot the leaves and kind of kill it. You just want to nestle those roots down in the soil and maybe use like, uh, I don't know, like a sticker or something to kind of hold the, that, that stem down. And then maybe within a week or two, that plant will um, be rooted. And what that does is it connects it to the mother plant and allows the mother plant to help it root faster because it's delivering nutrients and things like that to it. And uh, if you cut that off, it's, it's like an umbilical cord, you're just severing it. So, so you root. want to put it, while it's still attached to it, put it on the moist yeah. soil near I mean, it. And then once it roots in, cut it off? Yeah, if you're, if you, if you're the, you know, 4.0 grade A, <laughs> you know, the teacher, what the teacher told you, student. Yeah, I mean, like, that's the best thing you can do. If you cut them all off and set them on top of soil, you're probably going to get 95% success out of those anyway. But, you know, this almost guarantees 100% success. So, so I hope that helps you get that. I, I recommend it. And you'll, I mean, one spider plant will produce like 50 babies a year. And then you can just let those grow and they'll stay like that forever, just hanging off of the plant as well. So they'll grow all the way down to the ground eventually. Very interesting shaped plant. Yeah. It's not, doesn't take a lot of imagination to see how it got its name. Absolutely. So succulents, everybody knows succulents. It's like the hottest thing. 
to come, you know, over the last 10 years. Nobody knew what they were in the 90s, it seems like, but now they're everywhere. Um, this includes your more, more common ones like your aloe plants, your jades, and your sedums. Um, succulents is kind of like a slang term. It's used to uh, describe fleshy plants, and fleshy is just like very heavily water-filled plants, something you break open and you see like all, all the... Um, the plant cells are all clear instead of fibrous like wood or anything like that. Um, water lightly every week. These don't deal well with too much water. That's one of my biggest issues is that I used to water over water my succulents and I kept killing them. They'll get a root rot and as soon as the, the root rot gets in there they immediately um, get like a fungus in the actual plant itself which kind of prevents them from coming back. So this is a tough one because once you get them and they go bad. You can even get them with the rot in it already from stores. I've seen it like that. And the tough part is that it can spread to other plants. Uh, yeah, string of pearls is definitely a succulent. Um, and um, so anyway, yes, give this one, a, give these a try. Don't overwater them. You know, there's some really cool ones like um, Living Stones. I recommend a place called Telly's in Troy, 16 mile, 16 and a half mile in I think it's Ryan, uh, John R. Yeah, 16 and a half in John R. It's one of my favorite plant places in, in all of Metro Detroit. But, you know, these they have all kinds of cool stuff from bonsai trees to, you know, fruiting indoor, like mango trees and uh, like agave plants and just anything you want. You can get them and they can order it for you as well. That place is super, super cool. But they have more succulents than you'll ever know what to deal with. I think they're doing curbside pickup too for, for those that um, want to yeah, explore those options. Yep, as, as well. So, uh, best time to go, where's that? To, to Telly's? Oh, uh, Telly's selection changes throughout the year. So, right now they're heavily, um, they're, they have heavy house plants. Like, their tables are full of house plants, like the entire main greenhouse is mostly houseplants right now. There's like a cactus area, a succulent area. Um, there's a fairy garden area, an orchid area, like a trees area for your house where you can get like fiddly fig trees and dracaena trees and palm trees and um, citrus trees and bay leaf tree, like all kinds of stuff. And they, yeah, they do have carnivorous plants. They have honeydews and they have um, the, um, all common uh, Venus fly trap. So in the spring, they go heavily into perennials and into annuals and vegetable plants. They have a huge selection of really, really, really nice vegetable plants. And then in the fall, they go uh, really heavily into like, you know, your typical fall plantings and stuff like that. Like your, your aster plant and your um, perennial asters and coral bells and just stuff like that. So moving on to more succulents, the next slide is just a photo, I think, of, of all of the flower, uh, the different types. Yeah, so you can see in here from aloes to a string of pearls there on the bottom yeah, right, a jade, a, a jade up on the upper left, uh, upper right. And the funny thing about that is that just to the, the left of the jade, you see another kind of like red tipped succulent as well. That's a jade as well but that one's been tampered with um, growth hormones. And that's what the industry is doing right now with all of these succulent plants is they throw different growth hormones at them and they react differently and you get all of these crazy uh, looking plants. Sometimes you'll take them home and then after the growth hormone wears off, it reverts back to its parent plant and you have like this growth at the beginning and then you don't get that growth anymore. You just get like its original parent plant which would be like most likely the one on the upper right. So yeah, you have to fertilize succulents. Yeah. For succulents, like any plant, you know, like that soil is its lifeblood and as it's eating, it's consuming that soil and to help um, alleviate that load on the soil. That's what the fertilizer is there for. Somebody asked a wholesale question, although I don't recommend Amazon um, as a business though, but they do have a good price. You can buy like a hundred for what came out to like less than a dollar fifty or I can't remember exactly, but they do have a good price on them. Um, other than that, I don't know, 
Joe, do you know any wholesale succulent places? I mean, Telly's is always a good one to work with. Um, the whole, I mean, if you have a business yourself and you can buy from them wholesale, then um, they'll set you up with an account. I know that. And then you can get things priced less than retail. But um, somebody that specifically sells wholesale succulents in the area, no, I don't. It'd probably be some, whoever like supplies um, Home Depot and things like that locally. So... What about um, string of pearl tips for the winter? Um, Samantha's having some trouble with it. Is it the light issue? Is she overwatering? Do you think? I well, I I, <clears throat> I had one as well one time, and it died during the winter. And that was the last time I um, attempted string of pearls. And I do believe is because I was overwatering it during the winter. That was one that I would just I would moisten all of the soil, just like a typical house plant. And then later on, I kind of learned that I was supposed to only moisten the top of the soil because the, the roots don't go very deep and you want the soil to dry out with succulents in between waterings. Like some house plants, they don't mind moist soil. Like it's okay as long as it's not like soaking wet, but any type of uh, succulent that soil needs to dry out between uh, waterings for sure. Succulents do need a lot of light though. I know that I have had trouble with them in the winter from, from light issues. And I forgot string of pearls. I can't remember which one that is. It's uh, it's like a genetically modified version of another very common house plant that everybody has hanging around. But that's why it's kind of finicky because it was altered. What what extra fertilizer? Tips? How about Christmas cactus flower? Yeah, but like fertilizer after the Christmas cactus flowers will help the next season's flowers come in. So, um, you know, flowers are very dependent on the nutrient phosphorus so and you can get you can find some like house plant fertilizers that are fairly high in phosphorus and it won't really use phosphorus throughout the year maybe a little bit but then when it goes and it starts to need the uh the nutrient it'll be kind of in the soil already and so you want to do that right after it's done flowering yeah, yeah that I, wouldn't, like, jump on, like, I wouldn't sit there and wait with my watering can for the, like, <laughs> like yeah, I'd give it like a couple weeks. Okay. But if you haven't done that, could you just put the phosphorus out now? I would. Uh, yeah, you can. So, yeah. Shelly, again, um, prop, I would say the proper way to water, at least right now, is to let, you know, your soil dry out. Put that plant in as direct, you know, bright light as I can. Rotate it, you know, every couple of days. And as you know, you're monitoring the plant and you, and you think that the soil is dry, you can even take like a bamboo skewer or like, a, you know, like a paint stick or any type, you know, something you can stick down in the soil to see, you know, let it sit there for a second and you can see where the water, you know, like where the water, because dry soil won't saturate the stick, so wet soil will. And it'll kind of show you, you know, where your water level is at and your moisture level is at in the pot. I've seen a lot of people use a mist spray, like a spray, like a squirt bottle for succulents. Is that something you'd want to consider specifically for like these low water ones? So yeah, some, some things that have a lot of hairs on them, like the one in the bottom in the middle, that one can, those little hairs, um, that's like a desert plant. So when it's humid outside, those hairs grab water and then the plant takes the water in through the, uh, the leaves because the, the, the leaves capture those hairs or the water. So um, no, I would not get all of the soil wet, just the upper layer. Maybe you think, you know, if it was an eight inch pot, maybe two inches of soil. If it's a six inch pot, maybe an inch of soil. You know, if it's like a four inch pot, you might be dealing with, you know, something that, that was, that came from the, nur the nursery. Like if you had picked this up and it's not really been doing well since, uh, it could have, you know, like had some issue predisposed from, just traveling from the, you know, wherever they propagate this stuff. Because the funny thing about companies that sell this stuff in grand scale, they don't care if it's doing well, they just want you to buy it. So they send it with issues. And, you know, like we have to give talks on this stuff because people think that they're hurting their houseplants. So it's like, nah, it's unfortunate, but you bought a houseplant that was already dying. You didn't kill it, you know, or it had bugs underneath the leaves in those tiny, tiny little crevices which we'll talk on all that later after we're done with the plants. So um, just kind of how to inspect and what to look for. Mm -hmm. Could you do um, 
like if you had a pot and you were trying to figure out how to soil, just put your fingertip on the side of it. And once your fingertip gets wet, you know, you've reached saturation point. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that'll work as well. You kind of really got to like just pay attention, watch your soil to see, you know, if you pour water on it and it collects, then you probably have like a compacted kind of a soil that in that plant needs to be up potted. Um, if it's really porous and the water drains through it really quickly and easily, you know, that's that's a good thing, but it could be too porous as well. You know, there might be too much vermiculite or too much... Uh, perlite in that soil. That's that like crunchy white stuff that we find in our potting soil all the time. Um, and that stuff can just dry out soil. So when you do get soil, you know, go to uh, the store. Like I always go to Telly's because they make their own and uh, it's really good stuff. Yeah, Meyer is uh, Meyer's an another gnarly one. One thing you gotta watch out for is they spray this chemical on plants and it looks like a powdery kind of a white stuff looks like almost waxy and it's for when plants travel they cover it in like an insecticide so uh, they don't pick up hitchhikers along the way from different countries and stuff like that and uh, so if insects do try to eat the plant they bite through that insecticide and they die but we have to get that stuff off you know by wiping the leaves and cleaning these plants literally you know leaf by leaf or wiping the stems down and you'll be funny like next time you go to the store and you pay attention to those plants some stores do it automatically you know, like they have somebody do it in-house because it sells the plants better but some stores don't and you can see the ones that don't the plants just kind of look they don't look as is you know happy as they should because they're coating this nasty stuff but the last plant of the night is the zz plant common name is the zanzibar gem the zuzu plant and the eternity plant native to east africa water lightly this one's very susceptible to overwatering in the um you won't really be able to tell and then all of a sudden it'll just like this big stems will just start falling over and it's it's got that root rot i was talking about you can fertilize this one monthly and repot when the container becomes too small uh if the <clears throat> if it becomes top heavy transplant to a wider pot as well and this one you can see they took a pot and they set it down inside of a a little plant stand container and that's probably you know as you see how tall this plant gets and those it's kind of a succulent plant as well it, this is a, a good hybrid where succulents meet like woody plant material and it gets you know that upper level of of uh plant is actually pretty heavy in comparison to the lower layer so just be cautious of that so acquiring your plants you know like we all said where do we go what do we do um, family or friends, I think is the best one, you know, so if you have friends and stuff like that, or houseplant enthusiasts, as you're propagating your snake plants or, um, your spider plants or your succulents or whatever it is, you find a new cool one at the store and you send it out a runner or whatever, you know, chop it off, make a uh, cutting of that for your friend or your your cousin it's like you know especially this time right now where everybody's sitting inside and we're all we don't know what to do corona corona it's a great time to like give people those kind gestures and say hey you know i was thinking about you when i was trimming my plant the other day and i and i rooted a cutting for you and you just give them you know that out of the blue and it's it, you'd be everybody knows what that uh what yeah. that does for people so um neighbors this works well you know stores Purchase low at local nurseries. That's always my uh, thing. I even like English gardens, I'll put on there as a local nursery because I just know a lot of people that are directly affected by like the sale of plants through English gardens. And it's just a lot of people that, you know, are in the industry with me. Um, so, you know, when you spend a buck at English gardens, it actually goes to help, you know, the employees there as well as the owners. So, but Telly's is my local favorite, you know, that place is just the, even if you don't live in the area and you're just passing through one day, if you remember to just stop by 16 and a half mile in John R, go check out Telly's. I've now received a penny from Eric, the owner, uh, from all of my promotion for that store. But I've sent, you know, thousands of people his way, just telling them like, this is the place to go. He just, it's owned by a family and you just get that feeling, the people, the, the, the staff is extremely friendly and they're so knowledgeable. Like if you want to learn about bonsai, the uh, bonsai specialist 
will, you know, have you a private session with you right there and just explain they, how, how they the have art. a workshop right now about bonsai. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I saw that. Um, and it's really nice in there too. It's a nice experience. It's worth the drive. I mean, we got nothing else to do as well. <laughs> um, yeah. Take a long drive out to go to a store. <laughs> hey, it's, yeah. it's like 20 degrees outside and there's nothing that feels better than standing in a 75 degree greenhouse when it's sunny outside. You take your jacket off and you put your t-shirt on and you just stand there and you remember like, this is what, you know, the end of June feels like. And you just sit there and you're like, oh, it's, it, it's amazing. And that's, you know, why plant people stay, you know, so happy, especially the ones that get to work in greenhouses all winter long. What about, um, I'm not familiar, Ray Wegdens, Denenworths? Ray Wegens and Denenworths. Yeah, Denenworths is a cool one. I like them as well, local family. I've bought tons of stuff from them. They, uh, they've, uh, I used to recommend them a lot in my old neighborhood because it was right down the street from Denenworths. But um, Wegens, yeah, they're, Ray Wiggins is another great one. They're huge. I mean, I was at Ray Wiggins farm the other day, like, um, they're, I forgot what like, I mean, it was the equivalent of like 50 mile or, or something like that. And like Romeo plank or something. And all you, I was just looking down these rows of planted trees that they, that they grow out there. And there's just like thousands and thousands of trees, like supplying the greater Michigan area with trees. Like it, it's just, impressive to see what the Wiggins family has done with their farm. Yeah, so they're another really good one to uh, to get into as well. There's a lot of good nurseries, but I'm just, you know, I'm kind of habitual. I, I frequent my my one. But at work, we use Wiggins for all of our, our commercial stuff like that. That's where we get all of our trees and shrubs and a lot of, um, one thing that we use Wiggins for, they invested in their butterfly house, and that's kind of what prompted Ford House to get the butterfly house. I went out there one year and saw that they had like a, a caterpillar house that was there. So the caterpillars would eat the plants they put inside and then they would grow into butterflies and the butterflies would hatch and then they would let them go. But the little kids absolutely loved this. So we put it in that Ford house and then Emily can attest to the success of the butterfly house and recently won a, an award. Yeah, do you have uh, any... Um yeah, I don't, bad nurseries. The only bad nurseries I'd say are the biggest, the, the big box stores. That's unfortunate because that's where you find the best deals. But you know, I uh, I'm not. Well, afraid it's easy to, to do an impulse buy there too. That's how I get a lot more plants than I should. It's your oh, yeah. checkout lane. It's always right next to the checkout lane, and then oh, yeah, yeah you come so home. With. And it, it's really not what you the quality of plant that you get from like a local like plant specialist versus like a big box store is different because they go through them and they inspect them and they do all the stuff that we're about to talk about as well. So, you know, they don't get there to Home Depot. They, they arrive on the semi, they open it up and they go right to the shelf. So yeah, inspection time. Oh, we just bought a plant from Home Depot. What do we do? <laughs> so this is what you do. You look closely at your plant before you bring it in. Everybody is like, why, you know, what do you see? Do you see brown leaf tips? Now, what could that have been? You know, it's this time of year, all of these plants I've, I've been mentioning, they're being shipped from all over the place to Michigan. So people that have, you know, seasonal depression and COVID depression want to buy houseplants and they uh, go to, they flock to the store this time of year and they buy houseplants. So um, look at them before you bring them in, you know, what do you see? Those tropical plants don't ship very well in this cold, cold weather. You know, a lot of the semi trucks that they use are heated, but heated to the absolute minimum temperature. And a lot of them aren't, you know, like the most quality trucks. So they leak a bit and you'll get some cold damage on these plants or stunting on the plants that just don't allow them to be as vigorous as they should be right away. So you just kind of got to look for some issues. Um, what do you see? You know, do you see funguses? You might not know what a fungus is, but um, if you see something that you're kind of wondering you know, does that look weird? You're probably picking up on something, a diseases, insects, or, or you know, or damage. You know, a lot of things that you'll see, um, overwatering, humidity issues. A lot of these are more so like in, in your house. And this is what they look like. You know, say you, you know, inherited a plant years ago, look at it for a lot of these things. Um, improper light levels. This one you'll know uh, if your plant's been sitting in the same spot for a while and it's doing fine, then it's definitely not getting improper light levels. If you get a new plant that's not doing well, um, 
then uh, it, you know, I might have some of these issues for sure. Pot bound is one that uh, happens from inherited plants or plot plants that just sit around for too long. Ambient room temperature is too high. You know, I see this in people who, uh, you know, just are kind of chilly naturally, but they want to put their heat on like 74, 76 and stuff like that. A little warm, yeah, but um, it's amazing in a dry house how fast a, a house plant will dry out as well. So um, moving from house to house or tra transplant stress, when you do up pot plants and you um, kind of work the roots out from being super pot bound, they will go through a little stress, but it just takes a little bit of, you know, care, just watering them right, you know, once a week, like I was saying, and using that nice, good potting soil um, is going to help uh, reduce that stress quickly. Not enough water, so drought is uh, another big one. And then, you know, don't be afraid, like we all, Anybody that's interested in plants has killed a, a ton of plants. Like we all done it. You know what I mean? So like I, it happens, you know, I said earlier, you know, um, so he goes, um, yeah, you know, well, it should be doing better than it is, but it, it doesn't. So, you know, I just had to get rid of it. And I'm like, yeah, well, birds eat worms. There's a reason for things, you know, things happen for a reason. We don't understand them. Maybe that plant died because it needed to make space for the next plant that's going to thrive or something like that, you know? So we'll find the positive in the situation. Uh, insects, yeah. if you see insects in your house, you're going to have to do something about them pretty quickly. Uh, nutrient deficiencies, you can look those up online. You know, that's, that's its own talk in itself. So if you look up nutrient deficiencies in house plants, you'll see all these cool charts that'll pop up with like photos of what nutrient deficiencies look like in leaves. I do, I would always have a grow light uh, during the winter. Yes. Not like something overly intense, like a single strip LED four foot grow light is, is enough for a whole room of house plants. Like you don't have to go crazy and get some like, like you know, sodium halide thing yeah. from the local grow store. So there's some really like very expensive looking, nice looking home decor ones they have. And it's kind of funny to me. Cause it's like you could accomplish that with a quick light. Yeah. Um, yeah, on your bookshelf. <laughs> yeah. A lot of grow lights, you know, emit full spectrum, so it's actually healthy for us as well. And, and there's a question about time to start your starting. Yeah, everybody's going to start asking that question. So um, we do have um, a planning your garden workshop in, uh, coming up in March at Ford House. If you're interested, um, I should know what date's on, but I'm blanking on it right now. Oh, see, look at that. Um, thanks. It's on a Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, so if you're interested, um, how do I identify? But could you start them now for veggies? When When's a good time to start veggies? If you, it's too early to start now. The best thing that I always recommend, and this is, it, it'll be in the talk as well, pay attention to the back of the seed packet. So, you know, you don't know when the last frost is going to be, but in this part of the state, we can estimate fairly well that it's usually around May 15th, you know. That's never. the go-to advice for you guys. It's like, don't worry about it if you kill it. And then number two is read instructions. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, and then nobody can be like, well, they told me to read the instructions and the instructions <laughs> were right. Like, yeah. They were right. You should listen to them. How do you and identify how? fungi slash a bacterial infection? So those, those are, you know, like, uh, those are like moderate advanced level kind of a thing. As well, you can say like, you know, like people don't, I don't know if people understand how like helpful Google is. You can go to Google and be like, my Sansevieria has yellow spots with brown dots inside of them. And it'll be like, your Sansevieria has modded, you know, modeled blah, blah, blah fungus. And like, it really can like go through your question and the algorithm that they use is, is so spot on. We use it all the time. Like I ask Google direct questions on things that I'm looking for. What are these brown spots on the leaves of my house plant? And then you kind of compare, you know, you be as specific as you can. Like why are my um, spider plant leaves turning yellow? Um, you know, why won't my plant, grow? you know, like all, all kinds of stuff. And you'll be absolutely amazed at what um, you can, what information you can find on Google. So 
There's oh. also, if you do use social media, Facebook has quite a few houseplant um, groups um, that you can post uh, questions for it. And people will be like, oh, I've had that issue too. So that's a good um, kind of community forum for it. Um, if you like Facebook or you use it, I know there's tons of reason not to like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are your brown size drained orange water? And somebody said it's a sign of a certain uh, fungal infection. Yeah, I mean, that could be possible. Like the root, um, the root bark could have some type of infection as well. That would be a great one to bring to uh, up to Tully's. Not like don't bring your actual plant up there. They don't, they don't like like when you bring your plants indoors, but they do have specific workshops for like specific plants. So say you want to bring your, your plant in, they'll have a workshop for that where they'll work with you on your specific plant. So call Tully's and, uh, or go to their website or Facebook and look up, um, look up wherever you, uh, Oh, we're going to, um, I, that might be on your end, Cheryl. I don't, I haven't lost any sound. Yeah, but I'm still, I can see my mic is active. We're, so. I, we're saying that to her, but if she lost sound, she won't be able to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> you type to her in chat and I'll just keep going. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. One of the, one of the very, very common insects that we see all the time is this mealy bug. And, um, if you squish them, they're kind of sticky because they're actually filled with the sugars from the, uh, the plant sap. These are really easy to get rid of. You know, you can do it on your own just by squishing them, or you can take uh, like this plant. So a house plant, you take your, you put it in the, the tub, put cold water on and then take your shower head. If it's the, the kind you can disconnect and bring it down and just kind of power wash the bugs off of your, your house plant. Like these soft bodied insects are so week that if anything stresses them out like they get hit with too cold of water or you you know like they don't recover from damage so uh, if you hit them with a little bit of water um, they'll knock right off and then they'll die so there's gonna be eggs on these plants as well that you can't see because they're microscopic and then those eggs are gonna hatch and then you're gonna yeah those might be eggs potentially so when the eggs hatch you gotta go round two and possibly round three or four so what thing you can do to get rid of the eggs while you're getting rid of these is to take a cotton swab, dip it in rubbing alcohol, and just gently brush up all the stems and the bottoms of the leaves. Um, don't go too crazy, you know, don't saturate your plant in alcohol. It's just not good for it. But if you're gentle with it, you can, as the alcohol touches these insects, it kills them very quickly. Scale is another one. Um, this one can be very tough. You can use uh, mechanical removal like your finger as well picking them off but like when you get to the, that palm on the right at that point you have reached the uh, infestation so the white yeah. spots are the damage the black spots are the scales and uh, these ones are a tough one because you can spray them like in the middle photo you can see that they're two different colors the dark ones are hard bodied and the light ones are soft bodied when they're soft bodied you can spray them with um, like an insecticidal soap or like Dr. Bronner's peppermint soap or something like that, and it will kill them. But the hard body ones, they have a protective shell on them now, and there's eggs underneath there, essentially is what they're doing. And um, those are the ones you gotta scrape off. Then you can go to like a systemic insecticide, which is a you know pretty gnarly thing to use inside of a house, but um, it would be something that you dilute in water and then water your plant with. The plant will then take it up and any bug that is trying to drink the juices of the plant will die. So uh, you might want to, if, if you have a space to do that, uh, if you're doing that heavy insecticide, you might want to consider like quarantining it to a different room, uh, especially if you have any pets or kids. Yeah, I mean, and during the, the winter, you know, it's, I would just go as hard as I could on like mechanical uh, removal, trying to hit them with alcohol swabs. Sometimes you can get some of the alcohol underneath their shell, you know, if you're like, a, you, work, you work at them a little bit and then they'll, they'll die off. And the funny thing is that you can't really tell that they're dead. They'll just be there. When, and then, but if you touch them, they'll kind of fall off as opposed to when they're alive, they're really like rooted into that plant pretty well. 
So, but if you take your fingernail, you know, you can knock them off, but some people are just aren't, aren't uh, comfortable with it. So fungus gnats, you get these ones from just overly moistened soil. Uh, you know, the, the more, these happen a lot in greenhouses, but the more house plants you get, the more houses like a greenhouse. And uh, an easy way to deal with these is to take, a, you know, these little sticky strips, these uh, fly paper, we call it, and hang those. And those kind of just stick to it and then they, they die um, as they, um, I don't know, they're just stuck to it and they can't really eat anything. This is another, insects are very susceptible to stress. So when they get stressed, they die quickly. And um, same thing with the white flies, these little buggers, you know, they're not as common in the winter, but they are more common during the summer because they come in from the outdoors. And these are dealt well with, you know, the, the eggs are good. You can power wash them off with your shower head or, you know, sometimes we have like the, the little um, like jet thing off of your sink that works well as, or uh, fly strips. Another thing that is like an organic um, option is to take some, what was it? Uh, apple cider vinegar and like dilute 50, 50 with water and then take like a droplet of dish soap and put it in a bowl full of this, you know, it's like a common, I don't know, like little yeah, soup bowl. Yeah. And then that's they a good the um, fruit fly remedy yeah. as well. Yeah. Yep. It gets so, on them. And it's very sticky. Yeah, it works. And then usually, so this is in the Dr. Brunner's Kiss Steel Soap I was talking about earlier. So They changed the label stress. slightly though, but it looks yeah, very simple still. Mm -hmm. I know. They're, they're funny. So it's more to read now. Insects, um, stressed plants that have issues, you know, those are the ones. Um, this, any stressed plant is a potential host to bugs. It's kind of like the human body. Like the healthier we are, the less susceptible to like disease and infection um, than we are if we're unhealthy. So like the plants are the same way. The stronger the plant is, the healthier it is. And it just insects stay away from it because when a plant is stressed out, it emits some type of a, a compound that attracts bugs to it. And the bug knows that, you know, it's stressed out and it's going after whatever the plant is producing because it's stressed out. So if the, you have no stressed plants, then you have no insects. So it uh, works pretty well. So what we were saying earlier, this is just examples of how to wipe, you know, with cotton swabs and stuff like that. You always try to wipe with the the, like up the stems and with the veination of the leaves, don't try to wipe against things. So this is quickly a slide on like underwatered plants versus watered plants. So you can see on the left, you have underwatered plants and uh, they're so droopy. It's kind of like the peace lily idea, you know, that we were saying earlier. Middle plant, everything is nice and, and hydrated, standing tall, it's very proud. And then the overwatered plants, like we were talking earlier with, with um, you know, this, that can happen as well with uh, roots that the tips of roots that dry out, the tips of your plants can uh, dry as well. But overwatered, you can see the difference between overwatered, where it's still kind of standing proud, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't have the dehydrated look of underwatered. So, so we have a question yeah. about um, should you quarantine new plants, and if so, how long? Um, I don't quarantine new plants. I expect them pretty closely and if I find anything that you know is kind of sketchy I'll bring it to the attention of the store I'm shopping at because you know, it's you know it's their responsibility to make sure that their plants are not going to infest our homes but um, it is it would be smart and that best thing to do is like if you have a spare bathroom or something like that with light you know like a window or something just throw it in the shower or throw it you know like on the, the counter or something like that for a week or so and just uh, monitor it as, as it's sitting there. Uh, and there's, yeah, yeah I've we, had a lot of um, success with cinnamon too, and it's kind of one of those things. It's like, if it works or not, it's not a horrible thing to have your area smell like cinnamon. <laughs> yeah. There's not a lot of, yeah. Well, they're talking about this. You know, they're thinking about ordering like a pound of organic cinnamon and using it in the greenhouse at Ford House this year because okay, cool. um, they're trying to control algae growth on top of the soil in the greenhouse yeah. itself, and we we're, we're trying to figure out what the source of it is. We don't know if it's just like lack of airflow, too much humidity, 
um, yeah. something that's in the actual soil we're using. So we're going to try and use the cinnamon product and sprinkle it over everything to. Um, cool. You got to take a picture of what, how much that, what it looks like to have that much cinnamon. That'd be very not, cool looking. I used to work at a bakery and I didn't have to fill up a 55 gallon drum with cinnamon, like it rolled around. Yeah. And I'd that's have to cut these 50 pound bags open and they would like, I'll never forget that feeling. I'll never forget <laughs> clouds of cinnamon. But uh, fertilizing, so we're in the fertilizing now. So here's a DIY method. It's the winter right now, so you don't really have grass clippings, comfrey, or weeds, but this is a good one for the summer. So um, in a little couple slides, you'll see something similar to this. But this It'll give you a good idea of what to do. So what you do is you cut everything up into small pieces, you know, just you can just grab a handful of it and you take your garden shears and you just chop, 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 you know, just enough to fill up about a half of a five gallon bucket. You want to compact the material down. Some people will take like a, a piece of plywood and cut it to the, the diameter of the internal, you know, the internal diameter of the bucket, drill a bunch of like three quarter inch, half inch holes in it. And they'll take like a brick and stick it on top of it. Um, you want to fill that bucket, bucket with a, with water until the material is completely submerged, which it, actually makes more sense, you know, in the beginning to not um, put the rock, uh, or, you know, the, the plywood on top and let it kind of just uh, mix with the water for a while and then put that uh, rock on top of the, the, the plywood um, disc and then the brick on top. And kind of what you're thinking about is like a French press coffee maker at this point. You're trying to like strain and press all those leaves and, and kind of get some of those compounds out that you're, you're steeping. You're just making tea is really all you're doing and then you leave the bucket in the, in the sun for about a day and that really activates all the microbe activity in the water straighten off the solids you know with a piece of screen you can do this as well with like um you know any type of mesh bag um you just want to use something that will stop your like, watering can or sprayer from getting clogged up uh, you want to an old t-shirt could work on that too yeah any yeah. any yeah anything for sure um, then you want to take that material, that liquid, dilute it with 50% water. Um, I'm sure you could use straight water as well, but or just straight, just put this material straight into your plants. But we always dilute everything just in case anything, you know, something a little too strong in the in that compound. Um, you want to apply a few cups to each house plant when you're ready to do your watering. So you just take like you know your little Pyrex glass two cup deal, fill it up, dump it in each plant. You know, not, you know, if you have a forage pot that this big, it doesn't need two cups of water. So we got to, you know, <laughs> this is like, uh, you Common know, it's like, it, it's like taking your vitamins. So fertilizing round two, which you're going to talk about compost tea this time. What you're going to want to do is fill your, your like a garden sprayer, like those uh, one gallon or two and a half gallon sprayers you can buy at Home Depot for a couple bucks. You put the top on, you press the, the pump inside and it builds pressure inside. You pull a trigger on a little wand and it allows you to do like a real fine misty spray with it. Um, you can use it to water your plants or as a foliar fertilizer, which means um, it works well on things like, uh, like squash plants and cucumbers and stuff like that to help fight off your powdery mildews that we see a lot in this area. Powdery mildew is just, you know, it's an environmental thing caused by a lack of calcium in the soil. So if you find yourself having powdery mildew issues every year on your squash plants, then get a soluble calcium and uh, add that to your soil and, uh, or, and make some um, compost tea and you should be in the good after that. Um, use fairly as quickly as the biological element of the compost tea begins to die. So literally compost tea is life in water, like you've created life in water. There's just there's literally billions and billions of, of microbes that are like looking for the fine root hairs on plants so they can do their like symbiotic relationships and stuff that they do to help the plant take up nutrients better. Um, and there's all kinds of like micronutrients and macronutrients in that tea as well. Not at like insane levels, not like you're not spraying a miracle growing your plants, but compost tea is like the watered down version of, of creating your own natural miracle grow. And it's a, a lot more work than definitely going and getting um, fertilizer, but it's a good way of keeping that like cost low, number one. Yeah. And then two, you're, you can compost on a small uh, scale and it's pretty manageable. Um, 
you don't have to compost everything you do. You don't have to go overboard and do everything perfectly. Um, but I compost with this little bucket of memory sink and it's definitely something worth going into. We got, yeah. we have time for new projects. It's a good, good year for new projects. Um, <laughs> Oh, volunteer opportunities. There's a lot of different volunteer opportunities. Um, I know Bell Isle Conservancy prior to COVID-19 did have some um, garden volunteers that they'd have. Um, you probably want to talk to your local garden club um, for that. Uh, and then there's a lot of different opportunities since master gardeners do require a lot of. And we have a hand raised from Lynette. If you want to unmute yourself, you're welcome to. I saw the Lynette's hand get raised. If you click uh, in the chat and type your question in there. Um, that, that's a, yeah. yeah. We're, we're over. We're not very good at having uh, good time between Joe and I. Um, but here's a little diagram. You can get a lot of compost tea. Um, aquarium pumps are pretty cheap to buy too. Um, but there's a lot of compost tea how to um, online. So I just put my Instagram on there. So it's at Slinsky84 that you can come and send me photos or tag me in your, you know, I don't know how many people are using Instagram right now, but um, that's a good way to, to connect with me if you have, you know, questions or anything like that. Uh, so fertilize round three. This is the store-bought things, like I was saying earlier, not the best stuff in the world, but like, you know, if you're, if you need a quick result fast, miracle Grow, like I was saying, it works extremely well. I, th I forgot how many it is. It's like 16 micronutrients and three macronutrients that all plants require for life. And miracle Grow has every one of them in it. Now there are other fertilizers that have miracle Grow in it, but <clears throat> you'd have to learn what those compounds are and then learn how to read the back of the fertilizer label to understand, you know, exactly what you're getting. Uh, Osmocote is slow release. And this should be incorporated into your soil when you're transplanting or repotting your house plants. You know, you don't go crazy, maybe a tablespoon or two in uh, like an eight or 10 inch pot. But um, you can add this to your soil as well outside, but it actually does something in a house plant. It's okay because there's not a lot of um, natural like biology going on like there is outside. So what Osmocote in the actual soil in the earth does is it's, it limits the ability to actually like translocate nutrients. It'll actually like cause nutrients, natural nutrients in the soil to lock up in a way that the natural processes of like rain and acids and things like that in the soil, they would naturally like eat, eat up the, you know, the, the coats, the coatings on minerals, which would make them um, available for, for uh, roots to take up, but Osmocote actually stops that process. So I tell people, if you're going to use Osmocote, don't mess around with it outside. Even if you use it in like potted plants outside, don't take that soil and use it in your garden or things like that, because it can just kind of screw up the soil. That's something, you know, like below ground information you know, from going to conferences that they've kind of released about the product, but it, uh, it does work very well other than that, that an issue so question about putting tea bags into the soil you probably want to remove the staple um but could you just empty the contents and put it in the soil um yeah and it depends like you what compost like what your tea bags are made out of you know some tea, tea bags are compostable so like whenever we get that those ones usually don't have like a staple on them i've noticed there's like some type of a like yeah, yeah, it's like a thing at the top where it just all comes together. It's weird, but it works. Mm -hmm. But I just or cut if them open. Uh, if you use loose leaf tea too, it solved that problem. True. Um, yeah, yeah. you probably wouldn't want to overdo it though. You can put a little bit in the soil, but if you drink tea every day, your uh, plants are going to be all tea leaves and no soil <laughs> after a while. Yeah. So. So pot bound plants, you know, we can talk about this. This happens uh, in root heavy plants like that Chinese evergreen I was talking about, the Sansevieria. Those will actually break ceramic pots after, you know, becoming too pot bound. Um, repotting your plants will help you solve nutrient deficiencies. You want to use quality soil, not like garden soil from your from outside. Like you, you can, but you're going to have 
a headache later on, like, cause that soil will compact itself. You need something that's got, uh, you know, some type of uh, an aerating product in the actual mix itself, like the vermiculite product. I, I, I specifically like plants or plant soils with vermiculite because perlite is expanded, like an expanded glass product. And it actually has the ability to um, like burn your root tips and things like that is a another you know bit of underground information from the plant nerd world but um, <laughs> it, it has perlite exudes I forgot what it was I don't know something that we don't want to ingest either it's not something good but it's no good for uh, it's no good for the, the the root tips of the plants so fox farm is a very high quality soil that you can use you can find this stuff anywhere it's like at every local grow store don't be afraid to go in those places those people are super knowledgeable you know everybody thinks you know it's all centered around marijuana but it's really not nowadays you go in there and they're like oh you want to grow tomatoes we got everything for your tomatoes and they do like you can grow the best tomatoes in the middle of winter in your house and uh if you just set up like a little grow room in your basement or something so um more osmocote in the soil like i was saying if you're repotting add some of that Check plants, you know, throughout the year to see how they're doing. You can kind of like let them dry out a little bit, you know, not so bad that you know the the soil pulls away from the pulls away from the pot. But you know, as they're they're drying out and you feel that they're lighter, you can kind of like work them out of the the pot a little bit and check their roots. We see a lot of developing roots on the edge. It's probably a good thing to think about potting them, you know, to a larger pot. So pot bound plants uh, being pot bound means that the soil pretty much has been consumed. You can see this in a lot of, you know, inherited plants and things like that. They've just been sitting and sitting and sitting. There's like the, literally the soil has been eaten away. There's not much in there anymore. The ratio of roots to soil is way out of balance, way too many roots, not enough soil. The plant has simply just outgrown its container. The, there we go. Pot bound on the left. Look at that. Extremely bad. This is mostly what we see in the landscape industry on the left. That's mostly most of what we do is, you know, essentially do surgery on those root balls so they can send out lateral roots. The way that did, it is done now is that, you know, like that box wood on the bottom left, if you plant that pot like that, those roots will just thicken and thicken and thicken on top of each other. And eventually it's just going to be like, you know, thousands of little fingers strangulating each other. So yeah. if you cut those, you know, down the side, everywhere you cut the roots, you know, like with a soil knife or a pair of scissors or something, um, it will send out new roots into the soil. So it'll, uh, and it will kind of dispose of those old roots after it sends out new roots. So it's just something. It's amazing that, you know. how rough you can and should be with plants. Another thing, um, Kelly, a rosarian, when she goes through her um, rose care things, you really can hack them up and they prefer it. <laughs> a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, roses are a particular one. Those things are really, uh, they like abuse. Mm -hmm. Repotting, you know, like I was saying, you want to work around the soil to um, loosen the, up those uh, pot bound roots. Great example of the photos on the right. You want to work as much of that old junky soil out of there as you can, you know, and you want to be aggressive with it. You want to be gentle. It's like a practice in meditation, essentially, to do this because there's microscopic hairs located on all of those roots. Like you can't see them, but the, our job is to retain as much of that as, as possible. And you want to think of it like, you know, like since you're dealing with an infant, all those little microscopic hairs are very susceptible to um, stress. So the more you rip and tear and break, the more stress you're doing to the plant. So you just want to get it wet, you know, get in there with a pair of uh, like a fork and just kind of tease real slowly. You can notice that they, usually a circle in the same direction. It's like clockwise, counterclockwise. Um, very rarely do they, um, yeah, like that, there you go. You know, the, sometimes they grow up and down and in and out and then, you know, but those ones, it's okay, you can cut them. A, a, a root or two that gets cut isn't the end of the world. You know, choosing your container, this is a, a, a bit of advice that nobody, you know, a lot of people don't really think about. Um, so a new container should be a third to half times larger than the previous container. So you're looking at like a six inch container, you want to upgrade to like a eight or a 10 inch container. You, if you have a 12 inch, you want to look at like a 16 inch possibly. Um, avoid any containers that have a smaller, that are smaller on the top. 
and on the bottom. So like that one on the left in the photo where it's round, that plant, and if it's inside of a plastic pot that you set in there, you can use that all day long. But if you plant that plant inside of that pot, you essentially have to sacrifice that pot to get the plant out because that soil is in this ball-like shape inside of that pot and you can't pull that out the top of that pot. So it's extremely stressful on that plant to get it out of that pot and save the pot at the same time. So it's kind of like a piggy bank at that point. So repotting, uh, you want to fill the new pot partially with soil, just a little bit on the bottom to give those new roots something to rest on. They can dry out if they sit on the bottom of, you know, any type of a, a terracotta or ceramic pot that's not glazed. You want to slowly lower the plant roots into the soil surface and just work them in there a little bit using a tool or your hand, uh, work them down in the, I like to use like bamboo skewers and things like that. Um, they work real well for working in roots. Um, use your other hand to sprinkle the soil around, you know, so you have your plant here and you kind of just work around the edge and you just sprinkle it. So don't worry about making a mess either. Even in the photo, you know, you can see there's like soil all over the place, you know, put down like a, a sheet or something or like a, you know, a sheet tray or anything to catch the soil and just, you know, make a mess on top of that thing. It's more fun. Um, periodically tap the base of the pot, you know, it's just like on the, on the soil to like kind of work that uh, soil down. You don't want to slam it or anything like that. You don't want to compact. You're just kind of trying to help settle. Uh, continue filling the pot till you have about one inch of space around the rim. That one inch of space is usually a good, whenever I've no, like used one inch of space left between the plant, the soil surface and the, t and the edge of the top edge of the pot, and I fill that, that inch up when I'm watering real quick, just dump, 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 dump. And then that inch fills up and I stop watering. Usually one inch on the eight inch diameter pot, one inch on the six inch diameter pot, one inch on the four inch diameter pot. One inch always seems to be a good rule of thumb. When you're, try, when you're going above like a 10 inch pot or 12 inch pot, you usually want to start to increase that space because your volume of soil is becoming more and more and more at that point. But, uh, it uh, seems to be a kind of a fun rule of thumb to give yourself one inch of space because it will, uh, like that ratio of water to soil area is, is very similar. Um, you know, use a, stool, uh, a sticker or a hand tool to work the soil in the tough areas, like I was saying, like the bamboo skewer. They make all kinds of fun tools on the internet for this, especially in the bonsai world. And then finish by watering with a light solution of fertilizer just to help uh, combat the transplant stress. Okay, so we are, we went way, way over. So thanks for sticking with us. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions I want to put in the chat or um, unmute yourself? You're welcome to. We went over the last time we did this too. I think we we're just a little too ambitious with the amount of information. Joe has so many wonderful tips to share. And we had a lot of good questions. So that was great. Yeah, it was kind of, you know, fun to heed the questions as they came in. Yeah, that was good. That was good. Can we get, I'm What's sorry, can we, can we get Joe's contact information? Can we get your contact information? Yeah, I'll, I'll put my, uh, my email there at the Fort House in the chat. Thank you. Make sure I spell my last name properly. <laughs> Use coffee grounds to add to the soil. Is that good? Is that true? Yes, the coffee grounds is a good one. Um, all organic matter. My mom swears she takes her coffee grounds out. She dumps them around the bases of her uh, her um, roses. No, My well, mom. she was doing roses for a while, but then she started to do her um, hydrangeas, like these little oh. tiny little hydrangeas that she bought years ago, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden, like. I don't have a clue if it has anything to do with it, but man, they've been flowering something beautiful over like the last two years. So yeah. there's like a bowl that sits on the counter. Every time we have coffee, we dump our grounds in there and then she goes outside and sprinkles them. I mean, you will have yeah. a mound of coffee around the hydrangea in the spring, but you know, coffee grounds, the, water, the rain hits them and as we water, it just dissipates in the soil and they turn to compost. Yeah. Yeah, they're, um, coffee grounds have a fair amount of uh, nitrogen. And there's um, like there's a water cycle, there's a nitrogen cycle, and it's one that we don't learn enough about. Um, but it's a good one to reintroduce your your plants. 
Share a list quickly, and I'll just touch upon this because orchids are tough. Uh, any tips for orchids? Uh, yeah, if you're going to buy an orchid, pr be prepared to dedicate, you know, a good amount of time and money to them because, like, a lot of orchids, like houseplant orchids, except basically, like, the Philonopsis, the very common one, they require, like, weekly soaks in water. So you got to have, like, a dedicated bucket or your sink, and you got to have, like, a special, for like, orchid fertilizer, special orchid mulch to plant them in. There is something called water culturing where you can grow your orchids in water only, but it's like a breast um, done in like this acclimation period. So I won't really touch upon that. I'll just mention it. You want to try some fun stuff out, check out water culturing of, of orchids. But um, it's very pretty looking. Like when you see a shelf full of them, they're just growing in pure water. Essentially, there's nutrients in the water, but they, uh, you know, they just stick on the sides of trees naturally in like the tropical areas and then rainwater and things like that just run over them to feed them. So I've had um, some success with um, putting either a humidifier next to an orchid or putting my orchid then in the bathroom. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a good one. Um, although, yeah, I put a lot of effort into it and then it died. So it is one, but I got two blooms and congrats to Cheryl because she's got two blooming right now. Um, I have a so stem like, growing on mine, so I'm I'm excited. It's very exciting. Yeah. It takes yeah. a long time, but <laughs> yeah, it shows up. Um, Terrarium-sized plants, best place yeah, to get those. Both. I'm telling you guys, you got to go to Telly's. <laughs> it's going to be the good too. I am. I'm going to go to Telly's. Telly's has... <laughs> um a, a, an intense amount of like fairy garden plants terrarium plants and the funny thing like succulents not succulents but like carnivorous plants like they do so well in terrariums it's awesome like terrariums is kind of my fun like side thing but uh they do uh they do so much there like they have they have the market down locally when it comes to like hobby fun things for plants there's just like so many different specifics there then in the back, you can see all the like propagation area where they have like all the little trays with 144 plants in each tray and they're all this big and oh, wow. there's somebody up there individually potting up every single plant. That's amazing. So, yeah, it's, uh, it is something else. They have so much fun stuff there. Okay. I am trying to find the answer, an answer for a question that came in through the chat on what type of house plant they have. I don't, I would definitely get you an answer. I think it is a uh, polka dot plant. I would check that out. I'll send you the link that uh, I just pulled up. So this was to Samantha, so. Okay. Well, I think everybody had uh, enough of house plants for the evening, eh? <laughs> wow. I think it was awesome. Very awesome. I'm excited. I'll uh, hopefully I'll get rid of some of my brown, yellow spots of <laughs> my plants. <laughs> yeah. Send me a photo and we'll try to chase that out for you. Okay. I will. Thank you. Okay, so uh, everybody's happy. Like you see, they're happy too. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Really appreciate this, and thank you, Emily and Joe. Really, this is wonderful. All right. Well, Next time, hopefully, be nice and warm when we see yeah. you. <laughs> so.